Heavenly Father, I, I want to thank you for your word. Um, I want to thank you that it's, it's living and active and um, that there's stuff you want to say to us this morning. So I just pray, God, that you'd speak loud and clear. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been in Jonah. I'm just going to do the reading here. It's from Jonah 3, uh, 1 to 10. Just let people find it there. Their place in their Bible. Sort of. So um, we are in Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city and it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals or herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on gods. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with his compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and he did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. So last year, uh, Netflix released a film uh, called Don't Look Up. I don't know if anyone saw it, um, but it was a bit weird, a bit of a strange film. Don't know if we're getting PowerPoint. Yay! <laughs> It's good to see stuff working. Um, so there, there was a film uh, released uh, called Don't Look Up, starring uh, Jennifer Lawrence and Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, and the film is about two scientists who spot a comet uh, that is going to destroy the Earth in six months' time um, and kill everybody. Uh, so the scientists bring their findings to the US president, who doesn't take them seriously. Uh, and the whole drama revolves around uh, people who take the comet seriously uh, and people who don't take it seriously at all. But the idea of the film is really interesting, isn't it? Because how would you react to the news of a comet that's going to destroy the whole Earth in six months' time? How would you respond to news of the end of the world? Maybe you would take it seriously. Uh, maybe you'd be terrified. Uh, maybe you wouldn't care. Uh, maybe you'd quit your job and go on an amazing holiday um, for the six months that you have. Uh, some might try and get their fill in wild living, uh, whilst others might want to make it more meaningful. So our series of talks over the last number of weeks, we've been in Jonah, uh, and it's the story of a reluctant prophet and a merciful God. And so far in Jonah, we've met a prophet who's kind of bad at his job. God has given him a mission. He's given him a call to the people of Nineveh to repent, tell them to repent and to change their ways. But he is reluctant to share the message that God has given him. As well, he kind of hates and fears the Ninevites. He doesn't like them, doesn't want to bring this message to them. And so we've read about Jonah disobeying God and trying to run away from God uh, and his call, which is kind of a dumb idea. You can't really run away from God. And we've also seen that Jonah is kind of an arrogant guy over the last number of weeks. And so last week we saw Jonah encounter God's judgment and he's turfed into the sea. We've seen him encounter God's mercy and grace and how God sent the fish to swallow him. 
and to rescue him. But we also saw at the end of last week that Jonah still hasn't learned his lesson about God's mercy. And so this week we see Jonah finally going to Nineveh to share with the people that are God's message. And we see Jonah going to Nineveh, but we see him doing what God has asked of him through gritted teeth. Have you ever gone to serve God and, and, and done it through gritted teeth? Yeah, I have too. <laughs> and we also meet the people of Nineveh. And they are presented with their own end of the world experience. God is not happy with the people of Nineveh. And that is why he has sent Jonah. And what we see is the people doing some serious business with God. They repent. And God, whose default is to show us mercy and compassion and grace, relents. He shows Nineveh grace. And the first thing we see in our text today is that our God is the God of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. You get the idea, chances. He's the God of the second chance. In verses 1 to 2 we read, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. So when we come to the Bible as readers, we're sort of wondering, well, is Jonah actually going to obey God this time around? And what we see in these opening two verses is God giving Jonah a second chance to obey him. Now, God isn't asking him to choose. It is a command. Literally in the Hebrew, God is saying to Jonah, get up and go. It's quite forceful. But as readers, I don't know about you, but we're left amazed that God isn't giving up on Jonah. He's continuing to show mercy to this judgment-obsessed prophet. Jonah doesn't care if the people of Nineveh die. It's worth saying that from the get-go. But God cares. And the reason God won't give up on Jonah is that he wants to cultivate a heart of mercy within Jonah. Because God is merciful. It's central to his character. He wants to cultivate something of his heart in Jonah's heart. Something that is lacking currently in Jonah's heart is mercy. When God revealed his name to Moses in the book of Exodus, Exodus 34, 6, he revealed himself as this. He said he was Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. In verse 2, we see God say to Jonah that he must proclaim the message that he gives him. Jonah can't make up his own message here. It must be the message that God has for the city of Nineveh. In verse 3, we read, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. So he follows God's command. He gets up and he goes to Nineveh. Before we saw Jonah get up and go in totally the wrong direction. We saw him trying to run away from God last time around, to run away from God on his call. Last time around, instead of going up to Nineveh, we saw Jonah going down to the bottom of the sea. So Jonah has been shown a second chance here, and to his credit, he has obeyed God this time around. And scripture, if I had a Bible on me, it's way over there. If I was to flick through that Bible, it is jam-packed of people God, in his grace, gives a second chance to. This week, uh, I was reminded in the New Testament of Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, who is given an amazing second chance by Jesus. And what is really interesting is that Jesus sometimes gave Peter this title. Sometimes he called him Simon, son of Jonah. Don't know if you knew that. Uh, you can read about that in Matthew 16, 17. But this week I was thinking, why would Jesus call Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah? Because Peter's dad was called John. Why would Jesus do that? Well, like Jonah, Peter would flee from his call. Peter was called to be the rock 
on which Jesus Christ would build his church. But like Jonah, Peter would run away from that call, or at least try to. As well, like Jonah, Peter rejected God. He rejected Jesus. He pretended that he didn't even know him at one point. But like Jonah, Peter is given a second chance. In John 21, 15 to 19, we see Jesus reinstate Peter into the call that God had on his life and into the relationship that he was made for. It's the context here. Jesus is resurrected. Uh, he's cooking some breakfast for his disciples on a beach. Uh, and I'll just pick up with Jesus at verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? So he's saying, do you love me more than the fish that you've gone back to? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And of course, uh, Peter takes offense uh, at this. But I love how Jesus ends in verse 19 there. He just ends simply with the call, follow me. It's just amazing to see Peter showing this grace in the same way Jonah was invited back into the call that God had for him and the relationship that he was made for. And like Jonah, Peter was called to be a trailblazer. He was called to reach non-Jews. Uh, we see this in Acts chapter 10, where he was called to reach Cornelius and his family. Peter came good in the end. The vision that God gave him to reach these non-Jews, where was it given? was given in Joppa, the same city Jonah tried to run away from his call and the Lord from. But Peter would come good. He would go and he would complete the mission that God had given him. Because Jesus gives us second chances. And I want to ask us this morning, what does God's second chance mean for you? What does God's second chance mean for you? I mean, from Jonah and Peter, we can gain so much inspiration, not from them, so to speak. They were far from perfect. They tried to run away from their calling and their God. But we can gain inspiration for how God was at work in their lives through his scandalous grace, mercy and love and second chances it's an absolute scandal that we have been offered to receive unlimited forgiveness and second chances at the cross have you accepted jesus and received that mercy that second chance you know maybe for you today there's a sense in which you have uh, i think i'm speaking to most of us here is that we have received that that mercy and that grace and that second chance but we've not obeyed the call, that call to share that mercy with others, to share the good news about Jesus with others. We can take heart from Jonah. We can take heart from Peter, that there is a second chance for us to embrace the call that God has placed on our lives, to live for him, to live for his kingdom, and to share that love with others. So let's grab that mission by the horns because there's nothing worth more than knowing Jesus and making him known. So we've seen that Jonah gets a second chance and we will see that the people of Nineveh too get a second chance. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it and Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God and a fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning 
reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. So in verse 3, uh, we read that this city is a great metropolis, uh, a huge city. On holiday there, uh, I was in uh, some pretty big cities. I was in Istanbul in Turkey. There's a picture of it there, just to make you jealous. I'm just going to be one of those pastors who talks about his, his holidays <laughs> perpetually. Uh, so it was in Istanbul in Turkey and Bangkok in Thailand. I don't want to draw your attention to how great a time uh, me and Kirsty had when we were away. Uh, but these are mega cities. Uh, when you go to these cities, uh, you're just in awe uh, at how big they are and how they just seem to keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going. It feels like Belfast is a village uh, compared to these great cities. And the Hebrew this story today is written in, verse 3 actually says, Nineveh is a great city belonging to God. I love that. If you look into the Hebrew, God loves every city in the face of this earth. No matter what evil and good may happen there, God loves cities because God loves people. Every city belongs to God. And he wants to see cities transformed. I believe he loves this place too. The city of Nineveh, despite the mess that it's in, was absolutely loved by God. It was precious to him because of its people. It was more than the city of an arrogant king, more than its violent reputation, more than its false gods. It was a city that God loved. And I believe God loves this city of Belfast too, despite its messy, dingy, dirty, ugly past. But God is not happy with the direction of travel of Nineveh. He is not happy with the direction Nineveh is heading in. And he cannot stand by and do nothing about it because God is also a God of justice. He cannot stand, stand idly by while there is sin and brokenness and injustice going on. And there's consequences to sin. We suffer because of our selfish choices and ultimately they can separate us from God unless we trust in what Jesus has done at the cross and receive his forgiveness. And so in verse 4, Jonah arrives at this mega city to proclaim the message that God is going to judge Nineveh unless something changes soon. It takes three days probably to get around this city and share God's message. And we can already see that Jonah is kind of a bit blasé about sharing this message. He isn't bothered. After all, he hates the people of this city uh, and uh, he doesn't want to bring God's message to them. And what we see Jonah doing, instead of spending the full three days going around the city, we see him taking a day's journey into the city. So that means he probably didn't cover all the city. We see that Jonah here is doing the bare minimum that he has to do for God. And it's a bit odd, we don't even see Jonah talking about God and his message. He doesn't talk about the reasons for Nineveh falling or failing. He doesn't even talk about the way out for Nineveh, in other words, saying sorry to God, repenting and the city changing its ways. It's clear Jonah does not care about these people. And even though he's being obedient in going there, his heart is not in the right place. We have to ask, has Jonah really changed after being in the belly of the fish and being thrown up onto that beach? Or is he only doing this to avoid the consequences? You know, sometimes we, even as Christians, despite the mercy that we have been shown, we can really hate people too. Perhaps for you, like Jonah, there are specific people groups or people that even come to mind that you don't want to receive God's mercy. And that just isn't God's heart. What we see in verse five is that even though Jonah is not serious about his mission, the people of Nineveh are serious about doing business with God. In verse 5 is key. We see that the Ninevites trusted God. They showed that they are taking Jonah's message seriously in verses 5 
to 6, we read that everyone from the rich to the poor start fasting from food. We even read that the king humbles himself before God. He leaves his throne, the symbol of his power, the symbol of his authority. He removes his robes, the symbol of his wealth. He puts on sackcloth, the clothes of mourning and sadness, and he joins with the other people. The people of Nineveh are serious, and they want to get right with God, and they want to show it. It's a bit like if you want to get it in shape, uh, you probably want to show to yourself uh, and to other people uh, that you're serious about it. Uh, so you're going to buy that gym membership, right? You're going to go down to Sports Direct and you're going to buy some sporty clothes. You're going to get your Adidas. You're going to get some nice t-shirts, shorts, maybe a wee tracksuit. Maybe a fancy water bottle. I love a fancy water bottle. The metal ones. Maybe you're going to research oh, what's the healthiest diet uh, that I could get stuck into. Maybe you're going to have some kiwi fruits and blueberries, some rice. Maybe you're going to get a personal trainer. You're going to organize that all. The people of Nineveh are taking this seriously. They recognize that they have been living immorally as a city and as a community. They're taking this seriously. They're showing, they want to show that they're taking this seriously. They're wearing the sackcloth. They're sitting in the dust. But the irony is they're taking this seriously, but Jonah, the guy who's supposed to be God's rep, isn't taking this seriously at all. When was the last time you got serious with God? For some of us, it's like we're in first year, like Jonah. We're not taking him or his call seriously. The encouragement as we head into this new term is, as we head towards September, is to point our hearts and our whole lives towards God and his kingdom. How are you going to take God seriously in this next season? But the people of Nineveh showed that they're more than just serious about this, that they actually want to do something. I want you to think about the last time you were really sorry about something. Um, and it's not far for me to think about that because I, I have to be sorry for something all the time because yeah, I'm a bit of a bad lad at home. Um, but I want you to think about the last time you had to say sorry about something. Were you upset? Perhaps you were upset. You had that feeling in your gut like, I have done something wrong. I'm, I'm grieved that I've hurt this person's feelings. Perhaps you, in that moment, met with that person and, and said sorry. Perhaps as well you went even further and there was a change of direction where you said, I am not going to speak to this person like that anymore. Or I'm not going to do that thing that annoys them anymore. And we see that the Ninevites, they're not just taking this seriously. They're not just upset in their stomachs about what they've done. They're not just saying sorry, but there actually is a change of direction. There is a desire to change. In verses 7 to 10, we see that and we see the power of repentance. So this is the king talking. This is the proclamation of the king of Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals or herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. And this bit is key. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may have yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and he did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. So what we see is repentance hits the whole city. And in our day, as the church goes out and demonstrates the love of Jesus, shows compassion, you know, we will see individuals impacted, but we will see whole communities be, begin to be transformed. And, and what we want to see in this community is that sort of impact. I'd love to see that for Tolly Carnot. And we see this throughout history as the gospel goes out, that it transforms whole communities. It's not just an individualistic 
kind of thing. I wonder what would change in a city like Belfast look like if it received Jonah's warning? How would it change? Well, I don't think that we'd see many drug dealers on our streets. I don't think we'd have paramilitaries. I don't think we'd see individualism and the selfishness that we see, the kind of consumerism that we see in our city. I think we'd see radical change in Belfast if it received the kind of warning that Jonah gave. And then if it was a city known for its violence and its evil, think New York City or Los Angeles or a Bogota in Colombia. It had a violent reputation. It was a dangerous place. And what we see is the people of Nineveh repenting of their violence and changing. And this means they change direction from doing their thing to going towards God's ways and what was best for them and their community. It's not just empty talk for these people. It's real. They're responsive to God, unlike Jonah. And if you want to get in shape, yes, buy the gym membership. Yes, research the healthy recipes. Yes, buy the right clothes. But to get in shape, you have to turn up at the gym. You have to lift weights. You have to do stuff. You have to put on the clothing, not just keep it in your drawer. You have to actually make the food and eat the food to get in shape. And we see that uh, the people of Nineveh are doing this. They're not just talking uh, the talk, they're walking the walk. Even the king in verse 9 realizes that God is well within his rights to punish this city. But here's the unexpected part, at least for Jonah. In verse 10 we read that God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, and he relented, and he did not bring in them the destruction that he had threatened. Jonah warns that the city would be overthrown unless it changed. But we do see the city of Nineveh overthrown. We see it overthrown in a different way. We see it overthrown for God. Jonah was thinking that these guys are going to get destroyed and he's sort of rubbing his hands. He's looking forward to seeing these Ninevites that he hates being destroyed. But God had a different plan. God had a moral revolution in mind for Nineveh. As Jeremiah 18, 7 to 9 says, if at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down or destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and I will not inflict on it the disaster I have planned. The message here is that God notices when people are genuine with him and responsive to him. God doesn't dig it when people buy the gym equipment, they buy the gym membership, they make the appointment with a personal trainer and they research the healthy recipes but then they don't do anything about it. Does not dig that. He is attentive to people who genuinely repent. And what pleases him isn't that the people are fasting. It isn't the external things that the Ninevites are doing. It's the stuff going on here in the heart that they are genuinely choosing to change their ways away from violence, sin, and injustice. Contrast this with Jonah, who last week was all prayers and vows and promises to God, but he still struggles to do what God really wants him to do. Are you receptive to God like the people of Jonah? When he speaks, do you respond to him? Do you comply with him? Or do you do your own thing like Jonah? Is it all in your terms? Or is it in his terms? You know, I know often that I'm like Jonah. It's often all my terms. I do my thing. I'm stubborn. 
So as we come in for a land in this morning, what do we learn from this story? Well, the first thing we learn is that our God loves humility and repentance. And I feel that repentance and humility, they're, a bit of a, they're dirty words in our culture because they become associated with self-condemnation and religious guilt. But the biblical sense of the world could, word could not be more different. In the New Testament, repentance means literally a change of mind or a change of direction. It's about changing direction towards God and his best for us and his best for others. And I don't know how that could be associated with guilt and shame. In actual fact, it's an amazing opportunity. So I want to ask us this morning, how can you get serious with God in this next season? What areas of your life do you need to repent of and change direction in towards God's best? Another thing we learn is that God loves when people are responsive towards him. We see in the story that Jonah is resentful towards the Ninevites and that Jonah is unresponsive to God. But we, to our surprise, see that the people of Nineveh are open to Jonah, open to God, and they're really responsive to what God is doing and what God wants. So perhaps your response today is to respond to God when he speaks. Maybe he's speaking to you today and there's something you know you need to respond to. How can you respond to him today? Another thing we learn is God shows mercy to enemies. As Romans 5.10 reminds us, before we come to Christ and are living our own sinful way apart from him, we are effectively God's enemies. It says this in Romans for if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? God loves enemies and friends alike. His love is so great and his mercy is open to us while we were still sinners and enemies of him. Jonah believed that Nineveh was public enemy number one, that it deserved to be wiped off the face of the earth. But God wanted to say, actually, no, I have mercy for this city and community. So maybe your response today is to stop hating on people. Maybe there's someone that comes to mind or a people group. Maybe that's your response today. And finally, what maybe stood out today to you is that our God gives second chances. He gave a second chance to Jonah. He gave one to Nineveh. And he will give countless million, billion, trillion to you. Have you received Jesus for yourself? Because of the cross, we can stand forgiven. And there's just a beautiful invitation today for us to repent of our sin before our God and to live a life with him with purpose. Um, yeah.